So we are going to be recording today's call. Um, we'll post it afterward on our YouTube channel. And also WCTV has requested access to the recording to air on their station at a future date and time yet to be announced. So um, just wanted to let you all know that up front. A few weeks ago, I don't know, two or three weeks ago, I think it was, Kevin, I was fortunate enough to sit in on a call that we had with several chamber executives from around the state of Indiana and Kevin Brenniger, who is the president and CEO of the Indiana Chamber, was the presenter that day. Um, it was a lot of great information and the more I heard of that information, the more it seemed very relevant to our members here. And so I followed up with Kevin afterward and asked if he would be willing to share similar information with you all and he graciously agreed. So um, I want to give a shout out to Jeff Carter, who is the president of Bethany Seminary and the chair of our Issues and Advocacy Committee here locally. He um, may jump in and moderate a little bit later, so I wanted to make sure you all knew who he was and what his role was in today's call. Thanks, Jeff, for being with us. Thanks, Melissa. And also our the staff person, Roxy Deer, who's the director of membership and education, is going to be our moderator today. Well, kind of behind the scenes moderator. She'll make sure that everyone is um, in the room that wants to be, and she'll be taking care of the chat. So if you have questions throughout the presentation today, feel free to pop those in the chat and she'll be walking through some Q&A with you all in just a little bit. So with that, My, uh, Roxy, would you like to give any um, announcements, updates, or instructions before we get started? Um, I'll save all of our announcements for the end, um, but if you do have questions and you don't want to put them in the group chat, there is a private message feature in the chat box where you can send me a direct message and I will ask those questions for you. Great. Well, Kevin, thanks again for being with us today. I know you just got back from vacation and you've got a lot on your plate, but we appreciate you giving us about an hour of your time. And at, at this point, we're going to turn it over to you, let you share your screen and share some information that you've pulled together and um, also some brand new information. Yes, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me and, and taking time out of your busy schedules as well. Um, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to visit with you and, uh, and hear uh, uh, maybe a little bit about what's going on in uh, East Central Indiana. I'm going to um, present kind of three sets of information. The first is an update from Washington on what's going on with uh, or isn't going on with uh, Federal uh, Relief Act, what we're referring to as the Phase 4 bill, uh, the CARES Act, which you've probably heard that term by now, uh, which passed in March, was considered the Phase 3 bill, and there's been a lot of expectation and anticipation that there would be a Phase 4 bill, but it's kind of gotten bogged down as the, this one's become more difficult to negotiate between Speaker Pelosi and uh, the majority Democrats in the House and Senator McConnell and the majority Republicans in the Senate, as well as uh, the White House has been very involved as well. As well. Uh, then I'm going to share some information from a survey that we did of businesses across Indiana on uh, looking at how they have been impacted by the pandemic. Uh, we've done two surveys, one in April and then another one at the end of June and I'll be sharing some slides from, uh, that summarize the results from that June survey. And then um, the third item I'll have is uh, some slides on a um, snapshot presentation. The Indiana Chamber has a long-term economic development action plan called Indiana Vision 2025 that has been our guiding star uh, since it was first released in 2012. 
And um, in the odd numbered years, we produce a comprehensive report card that um, uh, compares Indiana to the other 49 states and to ourselves over time. We've got several different data points um, on how we're doing relative to the goals that are in that plan. Um, this year is obviously not in an odd numbered year, but we decided to do what we're calling a snapshot report that compares our performance on some key metrics to our four surrounding states, as well as to five competitor states uh, that we've identified that have similarities to Indiana, either in manufacturing or orthopedics or, or other areas. Um, so those are the three things that uh, I'm gonna do during our, our time together today. So let me start um, with a federal act, uh, federal update rather. Um, back in May, I believe it was, the, um, the House passed uh, a piece of legislation that they, uh, they always nice, they have nice acronyms for these things, whether it's the CARES Act, this one was called the HEROES Act, and um, it contained some um, $3 trillion in additional federal aid, much of that directed to assist states and localities, particularly states that maybe weren't um, well-managed fiscally and um, had large pension liabilities and other financial difficulties. Uh, the majority Republican, Senator McConnell, um, and um, our two senators, Senator Braun and Senator Young, um, said, you know what, that's too much additional spending. We think that there needs to be a supplemental uh, bill to, to go beyond the CARES Act, but we're thinking more in the, the, the terms of $1 trillion, which obviously is still a huge number. So uh, they came up with their own version, and it was called the HEALS Act, um, H-E-A-L, like heal a wound, not the heel of your foot or your shoe. Uh, and um, there, it was at a much lower level in terms of uh, financial aid and, and many, many provisions that were different than what the House came up with. Uh, the original thoughts were that uh, the two sides, uh, they would have some tough negotiations to do, but that they would um, reach an agreement before the August recess. Um, that recess has come and gone, and um, they're still negotiating. Uh, and in the meantime, as you probably know, President Trump uh, saw that the negotiations weren't gaining much traction or going anywhere. And so he said, well, I'm going to issue an executive order and do some of the things that are my priorities that I think I can do with um, the, uh, uh, through an executive order. Uh, and the main component of which was to extend um, federal uh, supplemental unemployment assistance on top of what the state provide, the states provide um, to the tune of what's ended up being, there were some in, uh, different interpretations between the White House and uh, they're using FEMA money, believe it or not, federal emergency management money um, to provide this, which is limited to, I believe it's $44 billion. Um, so it's expected that that will not last through the end of the year, which was the goal. Um, but instead of the $600 supplemental benefit per week that was in the CARES Act, which expired at the end of July, uh, the executive order provides for $300 additional um, supplemental assistance, and that will be retroactive back to July 1, but it will take some time for our Department of Workforce Development to one, receive those funds, and then establish a system to provide that supplement on top of our state unemployment benefit. The negotiations are ongoing, um, but they've, they've still got some pretty big chasms to um, come together on. Uh, we got word yesterday that the Senate is going to introduce another bill next week that will be a scaled down version trying to focus on some of the things that they have agreed on. Um, previously, Speaker Pelosi has said that she wants a comprehensive bill or nothing. So she's holding out for that. And I think, so that gives them more leveraging power. Um, and um, so even if the Senate passes this scaled down 
bill, um, it, it may not go anywhere um, in the House when it gets over there. Um, the president's executive order and the supplemental benefits through FEMA have relieved some of the pressure and some of the urgency on Congress to come up with a bill, um, but there is still a lot of interest there. So the, uh, our priorities with respect to this legislation, and we've been working with our friends at the U.S. Chamber on a joint task force, um, and, and uh, I've come up with a list of priorities. First and foremost is uh, lawsuit liability limitations for businesses, healthcare providers, uh, school employees, and PP, uh, personal protective equipment uh, providers. We don't want um, a situation where an, uh, an employer or business has followed the CDC guidelines, has uh, may, required masks, maintained social distancing, et cetera, and then have someone go into your store or your hospital, as I see our board member Craig King and Kenyon, uh, and say, you know, hey, I was in there a week ago. I now have tested positive for COVID. I believe I got it in your, your place of business and I'm gonna sue you. Um, so that's a high priority for us. Another high priority is um, assistance with unemployment insurance uh, trust funds. Many states have already uh, depleted their trust funds. Indiana situation is that we had about uh, $900 million in our trust fund. Those are all from taxes on businesses. Uh, it's the forced insurance policy, if you want to think of it that way. And we were working uh, collaboratively with the Holcomb administration and the Department of Workforce Development to build that fund back up after the Great Recession. And it was at about $900 million when the pandemic hit. It is now at about $90 million and will be depleted by uh, the middle of September. And at that point, we will have to borrow from the federal government unless some of our CARES Act money is used and moved over there, or there's some additional assistance in this phase for federal legislation if and when that ever um, can be agreed upon and passed. So those are some of the key things we're advocating for. Additionally, um, we've been strongly advocating that um, all C uh, organizations, uh, C6s, C4s, should be eligible for the payroll protection program, the PPP program. The original CARES Act only made that available to C3 organizations and all the other Cs, even though they're small businesses and important employers in all of our communities, they were excluded from participation and uh, many of them desperately need access to that payroll protection program. Um, so those are some of the key things that we're advocating there. Uh, Melissa, I'm gonna stop there uh, before going on to the next two segments and see if there's uh, questions that I can field. Absolutely. I know that was um, a lot of good information. Does anyone have any questions that they would like to ask? Um, I believe you can either put a, your question in the chat box, raise your hand. Is that an option on, our, on this call, Roxanne? Okay. Or probably just unmute yourself and chime in. <laughs> It'd be the other way. No. Okay. Well, if not, then I'll move okay. on to our uh, employer survey. And what is it? I'm not seeing any questions. Okay. Yes, No. Well, Melissa, I'm not seeing the, let me pull it up. Do you all see that now? Uh, pie chart? No, we're not. Okay. Why is that? Jeff, would you like to give a little preview of what next week's Issues and Advocacy Committee meeting is while we're getting the PowerPoint pulled up? Sure, I'm glad to. Thanks, Melissa. So next week, uh, Issues and Advocacy will be a meeting, and we're going to have the mayor with us, Dave Snow. And Dave is going to give us an overview of Richmond Rising. As we all know, Richmond Rising is a comprehensive plan for the, uh, for the city, 
and it includes uh, many steps and stages. Uh, not everything has been completely developed. And so we're engaging the mayor in a conversation about the comprehensive plan and looking for ways in which we might find synergy between the work of the chamber, our many partners, and with the city so that we can uh, have not only a supportive role, but be, uh, be part of the conversation as Richmond Rising continues to develop. So look forward to seeing everyone uh, next week at the Issues and Advocacy. We'll be meeting via Zoom. So if you'd like that link, um, please see Roxy or Melissa and we'd be glad to have you connected. Melissa, I found it. I think now it's on your screen. Yes, we can see that now. So okay. I had more choices than would fit on one screen, so I had to scroll down to, to, to find I have it. that problem often. So, uh, well, this is uh, the second of two statewide business surveys that we did on what is the impact of the been on the pandemic on your business. Uh, the first survey was done in uh, about the third week of April. Uh, this survey was done at the end of June. And um, I've got a few slides that uh, show the results from some of the key questions. The bottom line here is, is that the pandemic has been um, very impactful on businesses in Indiana and of course across the country. And in some cases, um, you know, absolutely devastating. And as we're seeing, uh, really even just this week, some of the impact um, is just now hitting when you talk about employment. Uh, I saw a report of a um, manufacturing facility up in a small county in Northeast Indiana that was uh, going to be shutting down entirely and impacting 300 employees. And you may have seen yesterday that uh, the NCAA, uh, that large um, prestigious organization that's headquartered in Indianapolis um, is going to furlough all 600 of its employees for eight weeks as a cost-cutting measure. Um, so one of the questions that we asked uh, in the survey early on was on a scale of one to ten, one being you weren't affected by the pandemic at all, 10 being dramatically, or what I call total devastation, how has the coronavirus and subsequent economic shutdown impacted your business? Uh, in our first survey in April, the average number response to that question on, again, a one to 10 scale was 7.4, a very high number, um, excuse me, 7.2. On this one, it was, the average was 6.4, so a little better uh, in June but versus April, but still very high in terms of the impact of the pandemic on their business operations. Evan, uh, we're, we're getting a question about how many businesses took the survey. Oh, yes. Um, uh, 1,200 businesses and, and they were pretty well spread geographically. I, I don't have all the, the, the demographics in this um, slide deck, but um, it was well represented geographically and the industry mix of the respondents uh, mirrored the industry mix of the state as a whole. But it was a very robust um, sample size and survey. So Thank good, you. good question and don't, don't hesitate to chime in with other things. Uh, we asked the question, what specific ways have, has your business been impacted thus far? 79% um, said they've experienced revenue losses. 42% said they've uh, had cash flow issues. Uh, and again, you know, with the early on when there was the stay at home order and restaurants and certain businesses were shut down entirely, you can imagine that um, particularly those kinds of businesses um, don't have a lot of cash stored away, so they have cash flow issues. Almost a third uh, suspended their operations entirely or were, were required to suspend their operations. 25% uh, said they laid off employees, and uh, only 14% said that there was no or minimal impact, um, and 4% said the business closed entirely. Evan, can you talk more about the um, size of businesses that were um, that took this survey? Were they all different sizes or were mm -hmm. they all large scale? No, they were all different sizes and, and mostly 
medium to smaller businesses. Um, what will be the primary challenge for your business to get back to normal? 36% uh, said personnel, 36% also said, and this was a, you could choose more than one category. So you see the, the percentages add up to more than 100%. 36% um, said customer retention would be a challenge. 33% um, a third said finances. Uh, another 23% said supply chain because they're suppliers. Um, operations were disruptive. 14% uh, said excessive government regulation. I, I suspect that those were businesses that were required to shut down uh, for a period of time during the stay at home orders. We asked a um, question about remote working. Is it compared to working on site? How do you evaluate the productivity of your workforce that was currently or was or is currently still working remotely? Uh, interestingly enough, 53% said that uh, their workforce was either uh, significantly or slightly less productive than uh, with, while working at home, and only 12% uh, said that they thought their employees were slightly or much more productive. So there was a bias towards saying that working from home may have been necessary, but um, but they, they didn't feel that the employees were as productive um, working in those remote locations. Uh, we asked, what long-term changes do you anticipate for your organization? And this was a real eye-opener. Um, the, um, particularly the, the first bar there, 62%, almost two thirds said that they will um, be changing their business model to adapt to what they expect to be the new reality um, post pandemic. Um, a third said that some or all employees will continue to work remotely. 22%, um, nearly a quarter, said that they will reduce their number of employees. They won't, their employment levels will not be as, as high post pandemic as they were before. Um, 14% said that they're going to uh, reduce the physical space required to operate their business because of remote work. Um, and then others said they're gonna increase the amount of physical space they need to account for um, expectations and requirements on social distancing. So, um, and that uh, are the high points or the highlights of our statewide employer survey. Um, Melissa or Roxy, I'll, I'll stop there and answer questions before moving on. So Kevin, what were the measures um, for productivity? Is that qualitative, quantitative? Is it more or less uh, impression of employers on whether employees offsite, onsite were more or less productive? Well, I, I'm sure it varied by employer. Um, in some places where they gather metrics, they could um, use objective measures, but I'm guessing a lot of it was um, subjective. Um, you know, the employer's belief or impressions about um, how things have worked out and, and how uh, more or less productive employer employees have been um, working uh, remotely versus in the, uh, the regular works uh, environment. Thank you. Other questions for Kevin? Yeah. Well, if not, I'll move on to the third um, area. This Sorry, can I interrupt? Um, I should have chimed in there. Uh, no, go ahead. It, are the results of the survey, do we have a link to a website where that's available? Is yes, it's uh, indianachamber.com slash reports, I believe. Okay, thanks. And it will be on there. Okay, do you now see a screen that has my name on it and our logo? We do. All right, good answer. <laughs> uh, this is our um, uh, snapshot, uh, our Indian Vision 2025. 
Um, that's the plan, that's the mission statement. Indiana will be a global leader in innovation and economic opportunities where enterprises and citizens prosper. That's our goal. We wanna be um, first of class and have a robust economy uh, where people can have uh, uh, living wage jobs and, uh, and raise their families. Uh, that's a copy of the, the cover of the 2020 snapshot uh, report uh, that was released in June. And uh, that came about through the support of these companies and uh, a number of others. Uh, I mentioned earlier that this comparison, instead of it being uh, Indiana versus all 50 states, uh, or all 49 other states, and 67 metrics that are in our biennial report, we narrowed down on some of the areas and the metrics that we thought were most important. And we compared ourselves just to our neighboring states. And uh, these uh, competitor states, um, which um, I'm going to redo this slide because they're, they don't, they're not shown uh, the way they would look on a U.S. map. Um, Utah wouldn't be in the lower right uh, of that, and uh, North Carolina wouldn't be up in where the Northeast states are. But those are the, the, the five states, Iowa, Minnesota, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Utah. Um, so and we thought that we could have a more um, specific comparisons if um, we, we narrowed down uh, from the from all 50 states. Indiana Vision 2025 has four pillars or what we call driver areas. First and foremost is outstanding talent. We want to raise up um, the talent level and the skill level of our citizenry, uh, particularly with respect to post-secondary degrees and credentials. And you'll see why in a moment. Uh, second pillar is attractive business climate. And third is superior infrastructure. And fourth is dynamic and creative culture. And there are goals within each of these pillar areas in the Vision 2025 plan. Move on. Well, there we go wasn't let me advance there for a moment. Uh, in the area of outstanding talent, um, the percentage of our population with associate's degrees or industry recognized credentials ranks 38th in, out of the 50 states. Um, the percentage of our population is bachelor's degrees is 39th. And the percentage of our population that uh, has not even earned a high school diploma um, puts us in the bottom third of the states. You can see um, with respect to science and technology degrees, the number 13 and 40. 13 is our rank in terms of science and technology degrees conferred by our colleges and universities um, per 100 po population. The number 40 is how many people that actually reside in Indiana that possess those degrees. So we produce a lot of what I call STEM degrees, science, uh, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But many of those individuals come here, get their degree, and, and then go elsewhere. So we need to do a better job of retaining the people uh, that we train and, and um teach those degrees. Um, that a theme here in, in this report card and, and in our Baena report card that I've latched onto is that our lower uh, per capita, um, no, let me back up, our lower post-secondary attainment compared to other states impacts negatively several of the other metrics in, in our report cards. Uh, one of which is per capita personal income. Um, this is 2019 data. Um, and when I compare it to our report card that had uh, last year that had 2017 data, 
we've gone from 38th lowest to 39th lowest in per capita personal income. And um, several years ago, we, we began looking at that adjusted for cost of living because I said, hey, well, wait a minute. It's, it, uh, your dollar will go farther in Indiana than it will in New York or Boston or LA. Um, so the real appropriate measure is per capita personal income um, adjusted for cost of living. In 2017, we ranked 38th in the first number, and we ranked 20th in the in the uh, when adjusted for cost of living. And I took some solace in that uh, and said, well, at least you know when you really factor in how far your dollar will go here versus other places we're in the top half of the states in terms of per capita personal income. Well, unfortunately, in just two years time, we have fallen uh, into the bottom half of 26. And what that says is, is that other states are growing higher paying jobs at a faster rate than we are. And I believe that part of the reason they're able to do that is because they have a more educated, a more well-educated citizenry than we do here in Indiana. And so. I believe our number one biggest challenge as a state is to lift up the skills, the education, and the knowledge of our adult population, as well as do everything we can to do a better job of preparing uh, our children in K-12 uh, for some sort of post-secondary education or training so that uh, they don't just stop with their high school diploma or, or even less. Um, I believe also that our um, lower educational attainment impacts um, the unhealthiness of our state. Um, there are reports that show that college educated individuals, uh, you, you have a hard time finding anyone, well, particularly under the age of say 50, who has a college degree who smokes. It is the lower educated, lower income, lower socioeconomic um, individuals who smoke, who are obese, and who abuse drugs. And unfortunately, because we, uh, we don't have as high a level of educational attainment, we are now 47th worst in our smoking rate. Our smoking rate in Indiana is 50% higher than the US average, and uh, that costs who's your businesses you say why does the chamber care about that um, and why should all chambers care about that is because it's estimated by the IU School of Public Health that um, smoking in Indiana costs who's your businesses 6.2 billion dollars a year in higher health care costs higher absenteeism and lost productivity <clears throat> and on the lost productivity I'll give you one example one study found that uh, in addition to whatever leave time you give your employees, vacation days, holidays, paid time off, however you do it, a smoker will take the equivalent of an additional three weeks off in smoke breaks throughout the year. That's real lost productivity. Kevin, uh, we're getting questions if yeah. these numbers include vaping or if these are just cigarette tobacco products. Right now, those numbers are just in, uh, tobacco products. Uh, but we also know, and, and I've, I've got a whole presentation on that, we've got a vaping crisis going on um, in our state. We know that, that the incidence of vaping in Indiana is higher than other states. Um, the, the vape shops and the proponents of vaping products will tell you that vaping is a step down from cigarettes and a step towards uh, quitting altogether, but the data don't back that up. Um, there are more people who go from um, vaping to cigarette use than from cigarette use to vaping. Um, and it's really become a problem in our schools. And um, it does not match up very well with the coronavirus because uh, we already have research showing that people that smoke and people who vape um, tend to get more ill uh, and have more deaths uh, than people that don't uh, because of the, the impact um, on the lungs. 
Um, our obesity rate um, is 50% higher than the number one state and our rank um, has gone up. On the drug-related deaths, we have made some progress. Um, we've actually seen a, uh, it, since the last um, report card two years ago, a 25% reduction in uh, the number of drug-related deaths per capita per year. Um, we would like to think that uh, our efforts on uh, Indiana workforce recovery, helping employers um, get good information, uh, get uh, understand how to identify drug abuse in the workplace, how to get employees into treatment, uh, has helped as, as well as certainly the governor's um, efforts with uh, the drug SAR and the program that they've done through the State Board of Health. So how do we compare to the, these, uh, our neighbors and our competitive states? Well, um, looking at uh, superior infrastructure, uh, there's a concern here with respect to electricity prices. Um, we have, at the turn of the century, we were about fifth or sixth lowest in electricity prices, and we're now 31st and rising. Much of that is because of either EPA required um, shift away from coal burning um, plants, or uh, some of those plants were just naturally reaching the end of their useful lives and needed to be replaced. But in the process of replacing them, the, the natural gas or the, the renewable energy facilities, uh, the cost of constructing those has gone into the rate base and, and caused our electricity rates to go up. The Indiana Chamber Foundation currently has a energy study underway to look at why and how has this all happened and what can we do to bend the curve of electricity prices in the future and what's the appropriate mix of fuel source uh, going forward. And we'll be releasing that study and sharing it with the General Assembly with some policy recommendations later this fall. Uh, there's how we compare to our peer states. Um, and for each one of these metrics, there is a comparison to the neighbor states and the peer states. And again, you can find this report at indianachamber.com slash reports. Um, we are higher than all of the peer states except Minnesota. Um, and you can see there's a pretty good uh, difference in, um, I think those are dollars per kilowatt hour or, or there's some particular um, appropriate comparison measure that is in that analysis. Moving to dynamic and creative culture, um, we sort of have good news and bad news. We rank in the top 10 states in four of um, the, the rankings, but um, we rank in the bottom 10 states in two of the most important rankings. And again, um, here's uh, a story related to um, our educational attainment. Um, in the uh, last year's comprehensive report card, we ranked fifth highest in job creation between um, 2017 and 2019, but we ranked fifth lowest in the country in new business startups. So we were growing jobs in the older, more mature companies uh, as the economy was expanding, but we weren't creating new businesses uh, at nearly the rate of other states. And in the long term, that's a problem because your older businesses tend to, to reach a peak of employment, uh, and it's the newer businesses that are the faster growing. And unfortunately, that's which uh, the ones we have fewer of and again, I, I can draw a connection to lower uh, rank and, and achievement levels in post-secondary education because um, it is individuals with more than a high school diploma um, that uh, by and large tend to be the, the new business, that, that start new businesses, that, that seek venture capital, et cetera. <clears throat> you can see from our surrounding states, we're fourth, uh, uh, in venture capital and uh, quite a bit behind Illinois. You've got Chicago as a big hub there. Also with respect to dynamic and creative culture, 
Um, as I mentioned, we had um, Michigan had the most top 10 rankings out of our Midwest neighbors. Uh, Utah um, had by far the most top 10 rankings among the, the five peer states that we looked at. Oops. And um, that is that report and that data. I'll stop and, and would love to have some discussion and questions. We have a question from Craig Kenyon. Those initiating urban flight are eyeing the Midwest. The number one question to the local realtors is, do you have broadband? Are there mm -hmm. current initiatives to expand broadband in Indiana? Yes, there are. Um, that's a great question, Craig. And, and I would chime in and say that I think that Indiana is well positioned to be the recipient of um, folks moving out of very densely populated, very expensive urban areas where um, the proliferation of the virus um, occurred very early on because people were sort of stacked up on top of one another and because of that data you saw that, that many employers are going to have um, either allow or require a portion of their workforce to continue to work remotely. And I'll give you an example. I've got, um, we have friends who are neighbors. They have a son who's the same age as ours. Our, our sons went through elementary, junior high, and high school together. Um, he's a brilliant math, math, mathematics kid. He is in working in Chicago, or was, um, had a small apartment with two other roommates in the cool area of Chicago, uh, somewhere near Rush Street, I'm told. And um, when the pandemic hit, all three of those uh, young men were um, sent home to work at home. Problem is there was, this apartment was so small that they had one table to work on. And so our neighbor's son came back to Noblesville where, where we live just north of Indianapolis. And he worked at mom and dad's house because they had much more room. And after a month or so, he declared to them, I'm not going back to Chicago. The company's gonna let me work remotely for what they pay me and for what I was paying just for my share of the apartment in Chicago. I can get an, uh, a bigger, nicer apartment that will have uh, an extra bedroom uh, just for that I can set up as an office. And I've heard other stories of, of friends and colleagues I have that have children in New York that are, that are coming back to Indiana uh, and realizing that their dollar will go a lot farther and if they're gonna have to work remotely, um, then they're gonna need some additional space uh, in their living quarters um, to be able to do that. And so I think we're well positioned. I've talked to uh, Elaine Beadle, who is the, um, new director of the Indiana uh, Development Authority that's the that's taken over the, the tourism and the outreach as well as um, the assignment from government, Governor Holcomb to recruit um, people with skills with talent into Indiana. We know that Illinois uh, for the third or maybe even sixth year in a row uh, has lost population uh, they've had net out migration. Indiana, the last two years, has had net in migration, and Illinois is one of the places where people are coming from. California last year lost a million people in population. They had a, they had a minus one million, I think it's 1.1 actually, million net out migration. Um, so I think we're well positioned, uh, but broadband, back to the question, is a key. Um, because if people are going to work remotely and they may want to be you know out in the country a bit where they can have some animals or or a you know vegetable garden or whatever um but they've got to have good access to reliable high-speed broadband um the governor year maybe two years ago now um reworked the lease on the indiana toll road and uh part of that is going for 100 million dollars of uh, for rural broadband development. Um, part of our, in, uh, and then the second thing is the 
Um, we received $2.4 billion from the federal government in the CARES Act and um, a portion of that money, and I'm sorry, I can't remember the, the exact dollar amount, uh, has been set aside to expand rural broadband as well. And we're pushing, we've made that a top priority in terms of what we've recommended that CARES Act money be used for. Um, and we're uh, hoping and continuing to advocate that more, even more of that money be used for broadband. Great. Kevin, another question on broadband from Brenda McLean in Western Wayne. She says broadband expansion has been hindered here previously by FCC maps that many say overstate broadband coverage in rural mm -hmm. areas. Are you working to have reliance on those maps reviewed? Um, not specifically, but um, I, I am, we're aware that um, saying there is access to broadband and being able to say that there is access to high speed broadband that, that we would all agree is at a reliable or, or as, as a uh, appropriate level of speed and reliability are two different things. Um, you know, it's one thing to say you've got access to broadband, but if it's dial up, uh, you know, you're probably not going to use it and you're not going to be very satisfied with it. Um, so there is a disconnect there. And um, unfortunately, the, um, the providers don't want to really lay their maps and what speeds there on the table because that's proprietary information and they use that for, you know, competitive purposes to decide what um, areas that they want to expand into. So it, it's a bit, it's a bit of a challenge, but um, we are urging that um, this has to be speed at a, at a reasonable level before you can really appropriately say that there's coverage in a, in a particular area of the state. So Kevin, Thank you, uh, Kevin. yep, thanks Roxy. Thank uh, Kevin, the, uh, the chamber, Wayne County Chamber, put together a task force to look at um, the pandemic recovery in mm -hmm. that process. We looked at seven different areas, uh, health, uh, healthcare, higher ed, uh, small business manufacturing, at-risk community, nonprofits, and arts. One of the pieces that came out of that was childcare, and that supports yes. a number of these areas. And so a question from one of the members is, how is the Indiana Chamber dealing with the growing need for childcare to support workforce um, and employ the employers generally? Well, one of the things we're doing is, well, two things. One, we're, we're uh, urging the Economic Recovery Task Force, which is charged with making recommendations to the governor as to how that $2.4 billion gets spent and it just somewhat coincidentally is there are um, five members of that task force from the private sector along with the current OMB director and the Secretary of Commerce. All five of those um, members on that task force, private sector members, are members of my board of directors. Uh, so I have a pretty good pipeline into that. And so we're urging that, uh, and, and we've given them a document early on and I followed it up with regular phone calls that um, that a portion of that money be dedicated for childcare assistance and that we're not going to get our economy fully back on track without addressing uh, the childcare pro problem because many of these facilities across the country have had to close uh, or curtail their operations as a result of the pandemic. Um, we're also with our friends at the US Chamber um, and, and my colleagues around the country uh, are advocating for um, child care funding and assistance in the, the phase four bill, if, if and when that ever comes about as well. But we agree completely that um, child care is a very key puzzle piece to getting our kind of economy completely back on track. And uh, it's, it's good that you all are recognizing that. Great. We have a question about um, COVID-19 and vaccines from Craig Kenyon again. Mm -hmm. Flu vaccines are now or will soon be available. I have heard reports that COVID-19 vaccines may be out in November, but that is not confirmed. Each of these vaccines have benefits towards ending this pandemic. However, surveys show that some are afraid to get the vaccine. Surveys also show that physicians have the largest control over influencing people to get the vaccine. 
How can the chamber connect with this issue to amplify vaccines and speed up the reopening of our economy? A great question. I've seen surveys that show um, as many as 50% of Americans are, would not, are not interested in getting the vaccine or are concerned about getting a vaccine. Um, I was on a uh, call um, yesterday. Uh, it's our joint U.S. Chamber, Council of State Chambers Task Force, and um, they brought in a gentleman who is um, in the trenches on the vaccine development, and um, he brought up something that I didn't know and that I think is very important to get the word on, uh, on is, and he said that um, any vaccine, I mean, while you may have some side effects like you do, some people do from a flu shot, you cannot get the virus from the vaccines. And so there's no reason to be, you know, the vaccine may or may not, the particular vaccine that you take may or may not be effective on preventing the virus. Uh, ultimately, we want to refine them to the so we get to the point where it is effective on as large a percentage of Americans as possible, but you shouldn't be afraid of um, accepting one of the, and there'll probably be multiple vaccines because the, the way that works, it's, it's not going to give you a full blown case of, of the COVID virus. And so I think that's an important piece of information to get out um, to the question of what we, the state chamber can do um, we're in a coalition with the State Medical Association, State Hospital Association, Anthem Blue Cross um, on, it's called the Alliance for Healthier Indiana. We're working on smoking, obesity, et cetera. And it occurs to me, we just had a meeting yesterday that, that at a subsequent meeting, um, we can certainly urge our friends in the State Medical Association to you know, have their doctors urging and pleading uh, with their patients um, to get the vaccine. Um, I also I had another thought that came to mind. Um, certainly anybody that, that's, that's in a hospital setting, and I apologize, I had, I had another thought on how we can get this, this word out. Um, but it, it's critically important because I've, I've, I've also seen surveys and, and our own um, communications has shown that we're not going to get back to, to some sense of nor a real normal until people feel comfortable resuming the activities that they were doing before, including particularly air travel, uh, going to conventions or seminars in person, um, and, you know, and having more personal interaction. Uh, because, I mean, you see the, the massive layoffs that the airlines are going through right now because people still, by and large, aren't flying um, for personal travel, you know, summer vacations. Uh, I just finished a 10-day vacation um, with my family. I have two um, children in their 20s. And it was originally supposed to be a, um, a cruise around the Baltic Sea to celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary. Instead, it was a driving lap around Lake Michigan, going up the Wisconsin side and up to Lake Superior and across Mackinac Bridge and down the other side. And we uh, stayed in three different cabins and brought our own food and never went to a restaurant, um, not even for carry out. And that's not a normal vacation for us. Um, and so, you know, the airlines didn't get our money. The, the restaurants didn't get our money. The crews line uh, didn't get our money. Um, there's some golf courses that did that I found, uh, but you know, it, it was not a normal Brinegar vacation per se. Um, and that scenario has played out, you know, all across the country. Kevin, I think in, in higher ed, we thought we would be living beyond the pandemic when we started the fall, at least that was the hope. And yes. now it's, it's quite obvious that rather than a mindset of life after COVID, really it is life with COVID. And yeah. at Greg's point, vaccination is going to be critically important. I think one thing that would be helpful yeah. from the Indiana Chamber is just messaging. So if we yeah. could have consistent messaging throughout the state on uh, encouraging folks to be vaccinated, 
would be incredibly yeah. helpful. And I know um, the local chamber would be willing to partner with uh, Reed on that as well. To turn yeah, to well, and thing. we have um, done that with respect to the masks. We've been very supportive of the governor's order, and you know we've been urging uh, members to you know require masks for employees, for for customers, et cetera. And um, most certainly, when there uh, are vaccines rolled out, um, we I, I can pledge to you we will be all over over that as well and trying to um, get the public comfortable and get those that are reluctant or resistant to, um, to change their mindset. It's all about normalizing these, these uh, different yeah. procedures. Exactly. I want to turn to a different doctor and that's Dr. Barrett. Uh, Brad Barrett is with us from, uh, from the State House and just any words from, uh, from you, Representative Barrett, about uh, this topic or what's happening at the State House? Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Hear you and see you. Well, I, uh, yeah, I turned on my camera. I appreciate the opportunity and, and thanks, Kevin, for connecting us to what's going on statewide through, through the chamber. And I think well, after- My pleasure and hopefully I didn't say anything that made your head blow up. <laughs> <laughs> no, everything was right on, right on track. And, and it seems like, you know, I'm new to the process, but every year there's, a, there's kind of a couple months cooling down phase when we, this year was a short session. We finished before any of this really heated up. So we've been done mm -hmm. since March 15th and quite a lot has happened. But um, as you were speaking, I just made a couple notes. Uh, we're already kind of talking about how things are gonna uh, develop for the state, uh, for the General Assembly next year. And I think this liability limitations that you talked about is gonna be a big subject for, you know, everything now has been done under mandate uh, through the governor's office uh, as executive orders. And, and we're all looking forward to getting back in the state house and, and actually debating and discussing and getting consensus opinions and coming up with some movement on liability limitations moving forward. Uh, I made a couple other quick notes, the, the rural bro broadband thing. The Lieutenant Governor's Office has created a position and I've been in communication with that office and I think this, certainly the virtual education and the work, the remote, remote work from home, just these very meetings have put great emphasis on the uh, limitations of rural broadband. And so- They, have, they absolutely have. And, and one of the, the priorities absolutely needs to be, um, we've got to have, um, uh, high-speed, reliable broadband available to every school in the state um, so that there's not an uneven playing field just in terms of trying to be able to deliver virtual instruction. Absolutely. For as long, for as, long as that's needed. Yeah, it's really exposed that deficiency out in this yeah. area. And to speak to Brenda's concern, I, they did say that they have challenged these FCC maps that there are companies that had contracts that overstated the ability of their broadband in those areas. And that is all being called out. It's all being challenged. They are setting new federal requirements in, ter in terms of upload and download speeds. So I can tell you there is work in that, in that direction. Good. And then I think- And that needs to be sorted out for sure. Absolutely. And then I think just the final thing that I'll say, because it's not my, uh, it's not my form, it's not my meeting, but I think, uh, you know, I appreciate the work that the chamber's done because I think, you know, this has been a health crisis and we've been worried about the health of the community. And if you look at the State Department of Health and, and my specialty, but it's grander than that, you know, it's the well-being of the individual and it's the well-being of the community. And that includes their mental health and their workspace and their economic well-being and all those things are tied together. So, I think I'm really looking forward to this next year where it's really a marriage and a joint effort between the health of a, of a state, of a district, of a community, and the economic well-being. And I think we're finding those things are very closely tied together. Yes, indeed. Great. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. And thank you, Kevin, for all of the outstanding information. Um, I think we've had great dialogue today certainly some statistics that we can walk away with and hopefully utilize as we um, strategize on how we in East Central Indiana move forward, but we're not alone. And the, you know, the purpose of bringing Kevin on today is really to demonstrate the fact that the local chamber does certain work at, here in East Central Indiana 
Um, but we have great partners at the Indiana Chamber and at the U.S. Chamber, and there's no sense in duplicating what's going on when we can all work together and play off of, of the strengths of each. And so, um, Kevin, thanks again for your time and for the work that you all are doing. And um, thank you all for attending today and posing some really strong questions and comments. Um, look forward to more discussion next Wednesday at noon in our Issues and Advocacy Committee meeting as we talk about how we move um, forward with the Richmond Rising plan. And again, if you would like to join us for that, I know Roxy pasted the link in the chat. And after today, we will be posting this recording on our YouTube channel, and we will send that out to everyone as well as sharing this with uh, WCTV. And so I'm sure Eric Marsh will enjoy sharing this with the community at large in the coming days or weeks. So Jeff, anything else you'd like to say before we close? No, this has been very helpful and uh, quite informative. So thanks, Kevin. Okay. My pleasure and, and hats off um, to you all for, for having me. And um, I appreciate the opportunity to have the exchange and, and share this information and, and uh, particularly hear um, what the priorities are and the challenges are in, in your area of the state. You've reinforced some important things as far as child care and broadband um, that um, we will carry that message to the state capitol. All right. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.